ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, Dying Time is here. That's right, we're talking about 1984's The Mutilator, a.k.a. Fall Break on Kill by Kill. Well, greetings and salutations, and it's your old pal, Patrick Hamilton, coming to you once again from the gorgeous eastern seaboard. This is the Kill by Kill podcast, where we are dedicated to celebrating the least discussed component of any horror film, the characters. We're going to unpack all the goriest of details of 1984's The Mutilator in the hopes that an co-ed's untimely end is just the beginning of the jokes that we might make at their expense. And as always, there's only one person I trust that if we're playing blind man's bluff, she will hand me a beer at the end. The one, the only, Gina Radcliffe. How are you doing today, Gina? I, I'm so excited to talk to you about fall break. <laughs> fall break. <laughs> I mean, that is a hell of a theme song, Gina. The you really went for and it. The, and the end. With a, with a, with a blooper reel. <laughs> I, I, we have seen over almost 200 movies for this podcast. Oh my God, that's true. This yeah. is the first one we've seen that has a blooper reel. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, a couple weeks ago, Shark Night 3D was the only one we had seen with a plot wrap about sharks and making ghost sharks. So, <laughs> you know, even five years in, we're finding new, wonderful areas to explore. <laughs> uh, so, Gina, I, I don't want to alarm you. But we are not alone. That's right. We have a very special guest. You may know her as a comedian and a writer and the host of the Kicking and Screaming podcast that matches horror and martial arts films into a killer double feature. She is the one, the only, Vanessa Guerrero. How are you doing today, Vanessa? That's a hell of an intro. Thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, it's all downhill from the intro. Anyone will tell you uh, this many years in. Uh, that's the, the most effort I give to anything. And then I coast from this moment on. Fantastic. Uh, same energy. We're matching vibes right now. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I have to ask you, because The Mutilator is one of these movies that I had watched probably four years ago, mm -hmm. you know, for the first time in forever. And I was like, oh, my God, we got to do this for the show. But I, I don't think any guest on the thing that we have come into contact would agree that this is the show they want to cover. And when I kind of like nudged it out in front of you you're like oh no we got to do the mutilator <laughs> yep I, I was waiting for literally anybody to let me talk about the mutilator <laughs> so what was your first experience with this and I, I i put this in real dick fingers motion picture it is a there's pictures and they move and sound comes out um oh yeah it's that it, it filmed at 24 frames per uh, second to give the illusion of movement i mean the whole nine yards yeah it uh i have so much affection for this like definitely by all definitions movie film um <laughs> i so i actually the first time i watched this movie um it was a fun, unique situation in which uh, I, I I should not have come out with like fond memories of it. But basically, okay. I was on a really bad date. Um, uh -huh. I was on a real just a just a date where I was like counting down the minutes until like I was like cannot wait until like you know the date is over and like he's out of my apartment mm -hmm. and I don't have to like be around this person anymore. And well, I was like, you know what? In a, in a movie theater or anything, you're you're in a private space. Yeah, it was like it was a, it was like a third date to where I was like, oh, this is pff, this is gonna be the last one. Um, <laughs> and like I was like, I, I don't even want to like put on a movie that I like know and and like because uh, mm. I, I, I don't even want to like continue interacting. I just want to like, you know, throw a movie on because we're not calling this dead yet, I guess. Um <laughs> And like, I was like scrolling through Shutter, and this was like 86 minutes. So I was like, cool, it's under 90 minutes. <laughs> like, right. I have an hour and a half left, and then I could just be like, date's over. And mm. my, the best part was because I was like already so like in my head, chalked, like chalked the night up as a waste. Um, every second, every delightful, ridiculous second of this movie was just a win where it was like, all right, I'm not bothering with the dude on my couch anymore. This is great. This is ridiculous. This is exactly the energy of like what I wanted tonight. You're locked. I'm in. locked right. in. It felt like I like uncovered a little treasure. 
<laughs> sure. Yes. I agree with you. <laughs> Where it was just like, all right, you know, we, uh, <laughs> we've got some very like great, uh, gore effects and like ridiculous for the sake of ridiculous in between. Um, and yeah. as soon as he left, I went online and I bought the arrow release of the movie. Oh, yes. I recommend it. The yeah. second it arrived, I watched the feature like documentary and loved it even more than I already did in that moment. Like the feature length doc only like as I was watching the feature length doc, I was literally looking up the city and going along the coastline, trying to find what the house looked like now to see if they were like doing screenings. Cause I was going to go to one. <laughs> it looks lovely. It, that that beach looks delightful to go to. Right? It looks gorgeous. I actually ended up finding the house. Um, oh. <laughs> and <laughs> when I had found it, it was like a year out from the last time they had actually done a screening at the uh, hotel where the casting crew stayed. So I just missed it. Uh, yeah, that sounds like a good, good, good time. I, well, I well think according, the, according to the trivia I read, the, the, the writer-director owns that hotel now. Yeah, his family owned it before, <laughs> yeah. and now he has it. And now he just makes it like a screening party house once a year where everybody just gets together and watches Fall Break and talks about the time <laughs> a town made a movie. And what a movie this town made. Right? Uh, let's, let's get right into this. If people have not watched The Mutilator, I, I highly encourage you to do so. You can, you can pause this and come back, or you can download, listen to the entire show, erase it, download it again. I'm not going to tell you your business, but we're going to start talking about The Mutilator. And of course, as always, uh, the spoilers are abundant. You, you know the deal by now. So uh, The Mutilator, we open on a house, and inside is a woman using a straight edge cake trowel to put beveled edges on what is obviously a store-bought cake. Yep. And already you can tell you don't trust this movie. Don't trust <laughs> any image you see from it. <laughs> yep. Yeah, it's got that sort of like kind of mayonnaise-y, you know, look to everything where you're like, this, this is when times were good. Yeah. I got... I got serious pieces vibes from the opening. Yes! Of this oh yeah, picture. definitely. That's what sold me on it because I was getting pieces vibes and I'm such a sucker for like the eighties slasher movie that happened to like bank on all of the other ones. So it just like threw all mm -hmm. of the tropes at the wall, like spaghetti and was like, I guess they're all going in. <laughs> and of course this has a real Friday the 13th reactionary sort of thing going on. We have, the opening incident with the banks on family trauma. We've got, uh, you know, old, we've got uh, young adults rather than teens, which uh, I'm a big fan of. And uh, of it's course, a, a couple uh, old adults. Yeah. In, the, old adults. In, in, Ed's, in Ed's case, an old adult, a grizzled old adult who we know yep. almost nothing about, but let's learn a little bit more about him as we go along. Um, this is mom. Ed mom is never given a name. She Ever. simply exists as mom. <laughs> she is somehow dressed like a real estate stewardess. Mm -hmm. I don't know what that combo is, but it's got a real loose tie and funky pants. But wait, uh, someone is staring at her butt. Who is it? It's Ed Jr. And he has decided to give his father the best gift that any child can give their parent. Clean guns. Clean their loaded, their, their, their loaded rifle collection. That might be the moment that actually like sold me. I think the note on the wall that says, happy birthday, daddy, I cleaned your guns for you. <laughs> I mean, it's the thing he loves the most. Like the second I saw that, I was like, yeah, I'm in. Sure. And it may not surprise, <laughs> uh, I, obviously it's not going to surprise either of you, but certainly the audience. Uh, this does not end well because Junior ends up shooting his mother at the base of her spine through a wall. I mean, it's a real choice maneuver that happens here. Uh, and as you can imagine, you know, you're thinking, just wait till your father gets home at junior. And then he does immediately. It's like, he hears the gunshot and pulls right up. And as soon as big Ed walks to the door, you could just hear his brain snap. Yep. <laughs> yeah. He's that gone. man was he, like he, 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 barely tethered he, he, to reality already as it was. Yeah. I mean, he owned a battle ax. So he was, you know, he was <laughs> clinging on. He was clinging to sanity by, by the most gossamer thread already. I mean, Big Ed and a guy, the person who was most into Dungeons and Dragons in high school when I was growing up. Those are two people I know who owned battle axes. And that's it. I, what is the battle axe, uh, you know, market these days? Like there was that 
There used to be this, uh, well, I guess the mall is still there in Eagle Rock, California. It used to be like a real mall, but slowly but surely all the real stores kind of left. And then all that was left was like decorative sword stores. <laughs> and at one point they mm-hmm. had two. You mean like there was like more than one? Wa- there was more than one? Yes, there was okay. more than Oh, in one. Los Angeles, there's so many. In Los Angeles, <laughs> like as a child, you could truly thrive off of all of the fake weapons a shady old guy will sell you when you're like 12. <laughs> <laughs> like I had, I had more access to ninja stars than I did porn. That oh my god, me too. Great ratio. <laughs> yeah, I know. For whatever reason, like Los Angeles was fucking rife with. Yeah, it. I got a butterfly knife so easily at like fourteen. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Vanessa, we're like peas in a pod already. Here. So, um, Big Ed, you know, upon seeing this scene, there's the only one thing he can do, and that is slap Junior right across the face. So Junior lights out and Big Ed, now he, obviously his life has been torn asunder. He's lost his wife and he reacts as anyone would in the situation. He drags the, her dead body into the den, props her up right next to a globe whiskey bar and just shares a drink with her corpse, you know, like a human. Yeah. Like humans do. Just has a nice little birthday uh, cocktail. <laughs> <laughs> just pours a little in her mouth and a lot in his and that's an evening and then without any sort of description of what is happening we just flash forward to what must be based on the age of the actor 25 30 years later <laughs> Who knows? Because they're like taking a break from school, but like, I don't know if they're like, if, if this is like a much later kind yeah. of school, I didn't go to college. If this is like a much later <laughs> kind of yeah, school. I, I, that, it's, I'm glad you brought that up about not going to college. Cause I, I did go to college for a year or so, but I, I was never, I never was, a you know, did the residential thing mm-hmm. is fall break. That is that a thing? I don't. It's supposedly it is more on the East Coast than it is out here. I never heard of fall break until watching the documentary for this movie. It, it sounds like science fiction. I would you know, understand, you know, a, a few days off for Thanksgiving. But I mean, you just started school in September and now you're taking there's like a break in between that and Thanksgiving. Well, how else are you going to force, you know, 40 to 50 natty lights down your gullet unless you're given ample opportunity to do it, Gina? Exactly. Because they were they were very much like, well, we've got to do something for this. It's fall break. <laughs> <laughs> My God, we all know that this is a thing and it's not made up. We have to do something, you guys. So around this table, let's introduce the various players at hand. We have Ed Jr., former child manslaughter pinup of 1975. And then we have Ed's girl, Pam, who no one listens to for 80 minutes straight in this entire love, motion picture. I love Pam. I love, oh. I love Pam. I love Pam and I love her karate. <laughs> I love Pam. I love her puffy vest. Uh, you know, I love how she knows how to make a fire. What I don't love is that everyone simply ignores everything that comes out of her mouth. And it's all reasonable. No, yes. She's entirely the smartest person in this motion picture. And a couple of people that we're about to meet, that's, I mean, the bar is set very low for smarts in this motion picture. Uh, We're also presented with Ralph, who is our resident jokester. Uh, (laughs) He's also a decorative sweater advocate. He has an affectation that I wanted to ask both of you about because I can't say I've encountered it outside of like preschool. And that is someone who smiles with their tongue between their teeth. I I think he's just supposed to, that's supposed to make him like, you know, kooky. Mm, Yeah, that's kind of what he was going for. Uh, you know, he was not going for that. He was going for alcoholic. So <laughs> yeah. Or magician, um, which I eh, kind of the same thing. I've dated a lot of magicians. Uh, <laughs> well, who amongst us uh, hasn't pulled that uh, card out of the, the, their sleeve. God, I pulled that card like four times. <laughs> um, <laughs> just a full deck of magicians. Again, growing up in Los Angeles, very specific experiences that are only native to here. How many times have you been forced to go to the magic castle? And like, no, we have to go see this person. And then you're like, they're rubbing elbows. Is that something you've had to do? No less than 30. Like I, (laughs) (laughs) I have been to the magic castle for like 
quote unquote net working purposes yeah. and a couple times for funsies because like I like the ghost piano oh, yeah, sure. so Who many doesn't? times. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> they, they serve, it's not a great restaurant, but it is a great bar. And uh, occasionally you come across a really great magician there and some really not great ones. Yeah. <laughs> the Magic Castle. Come and visit it when you're here in Los Angeles. And so also at this table, we have Linda. And when, upon hearing that uh, they don't have plans for fall break, she states that how she is going to spend it is, quote, getting high score on video machine. Yep. Like a VCR? Is that, is our, our favorite our favorite game of the 80s, the video machine. <laughs> like, what was your highest score on video machine? Took me right back. Ah, <laughs> uh, yes, video machine. 800,000 points. I made sure to put my initials as ASS. <laughs> I remember Video Machine Fever, that great song that hit the top of the charts. <laughs> yeah, I, I remember, you know, signing up to the play a couple of video machine tournaments. Yeah. Mm, and, yes. And of course, uh, Mike, a single cell creature with a wig. Um, he's like an okay looking couch disguised as a man. I, yeah. I don't know how Mike exists in the real world. He's obviously, I think I'm going to reach here. He's a sex idiot. Yeah. He's breeder stock. Yeah. He's, he's a, he's a hot guy that keeps the mattress warm. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you know, I'm going to say something possibly shocking to you. Okay. Patrick, yeah, sure. Considering how long you've been doing this. Mm-hmm. Uh, as compared to a lot of the other movies we've covered in this same vein, mm-hmm. I didn't hate these people. <laughs> right? <laughs> I, I, Ralph, I hate, but everyone else, I'm, 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 I like. You know, I, I felt a little bad when Ralph did it. You know, I mean, he was he was annoying, but not not as annoying as other jokester characters in yeah. other similar movies. And the most most important thing, I actually bought that these people were friends. True. Oh, yeah. which, which, which you which you know for me, that's a big one for me that, you know, that that really takes me out of a movie is that these people don't seem like they would hang out together. So, you know, it, it, it's just, you know, a thing that, that, you know, puts me off. But here they actually seem like, I mean, yeah, sure, you know, you know Ed is, you know, about a decade older than everybody else, <laughs> sure. but, uh, you know, maybe he just went back to college late. Who knows? He's right. had a rough life. Yeah, maybe he's getting a master's. Who's to say? It's kind of like a Prince of Darkness situation where those people are students, but they're, you know, range anywhere from 55 to 25. And here, exactly. I, I think that range might still exist. I'm not particularly sure. <laughs> 37 to 18. Yeah, they appear to be in 19th grade. I'm not sure where in school they are, but yeah, it's a little bit higher up the rank. I will say, I think their chemistry is a big part of, like, I think you saw the doc as well. Mm -hmm. Everyone, like, I guess was super tight and they had parties every single night. Yeah, there's nothing else to do. Like, they were there off season. So, like, the only time you're really going to, uh, have fun after a long shoot of doing horror movies, like hanging out and drinking beer with one another. And that's what they do. Yeah. And that, that energy radiates off like they. Yes, and definitely. It's a big change for a show that started off chronicling every death in a Friday the 13th movie. Like we ranged the gambit there where they started off like people who might know one another. And it quickly became a group of people arranged by throwing darts at a phone book it just doesn't make <laughs> right sense. i i think that the 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 probably the most egregious example of this would be friday 13th part seven yes. yes where every single person in that house just openly loathed each other <laughs> that's right they all had beef <laughs> and, and, I, and I get, and I get, oh, well, you know, they all had being the one guy's friend in common, yeah. but like, you, you know, they're not going to spend, you know, a whole weekend at a cabin out in the middle of nowhere, you know, with people they hate for this one guy <laughs> who didn't even show up because he didn't even get killed. He just didn't show up. Right. No, he tot he totes gets murdered. Oh, does he? Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. And in fact, the, the lady who's his girlfriend and that lives in my neighborhood, which is something oh. that I recently learned. So uh, bring her on the show. <laughs> I need to know all the information from knock her. on her knock on her door and say hi. I have a podcast because <laughs> people love that. Yes. Oh, oh, you know what? Here's one thing everyone enjoys in Southern California. <laughs> hi, you might know me. I have a podcast. <laughs> yeah, 
Yeah, both of you showed up at my door like two weeks ago and you're like, hey, we have a podcast. And I was just like, oh, sweet. Come inside. And now everyone's in my home because we've just been living here for two weeks. Yeah, that's how it works. That's how it happens. Yep. So Ed Jr. receives a phone call. Uh, <laughs> and, and so he's taking notes while Pam just very casually tells all of his friends that, yeah, um, Ed Jr. kind of shot his mom and he, and she's dead. <laughs> <laughs> and everyone kind of <laughs> takes that pretty easily. Everybody's like, "Whoa, well, okay, yeah. it's time to go. To, it's time to go to the beach house now." Yeah. But here's yeah. the thing: I mean, this the, the you know the motivation, as it were, for 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 Big Ed is so thinly written. It's it's almost comical. Mm -hmm. Like like we don't know anything about like what happened to little Ed after he shoots his mom. Like if he went to go live somewhere else, if he you know, had to go to a youth home or anything like that. All we know is that, you know, Big Ed's, uh, Big Ed spent a lot of time you know, hunting, taking pictures of dead bodies and collecting you know, instruments of murder. Yeah. Occasionally yeah. running over friends with an outboard motor <laughs> and taking <laughs> photographs of it after the fact, like, Hey, this is a fun moment. we all remember say cheese. Now let's get you to a hospital eventually. And walks away. <laughs> and everyone's like, okay. I mean, I mean, Ed, you know, Ed Field seems pretty all right for someone who shot his own mother. To yeah, it's true. He's remarkably put together. He doesn't like to be woken up all of a sudden, and he does sleep in his clothes. But outside of that, he seems like a normal guy. <laughs> yeah, real you know, well adjusted. Mm -hmm. I'm just thinking of uh, it, this is sort of like the slasher movie version of remember the movie Garden State? Oh yeah, oh yeah. Where, where the big reveal is that he accidentally killed his mother, and that's why his dad didn't like him anymore. Yeah. <laughs> you know? mm. like, yeah. And then the uh, the character was just sort of like catatonic from this incident that happened like a decade or so earlier. Sure. And then you've got like, the flip side of this, and you know Ed's apparently told no one except Pam about you know his mother being dead at his you know own hand accidentally but still you know he just has seemed to have fully recovered from such a horrifying incident yeah he's doing great yeah now all i can think about is pam taking off headphones and putting them on ed jr and saying this is going to change your life and through the headphones he hears a ball break <laughs> with so much saxophone so much saxophone that you feel like <laughs> It might be too much saxophone. And I didn't think that was possible until just. Yeah, then. it really. Every time I hear that song, I have to remind myself that it's not Huey Lewis in the news, <laughs> but it sounds like what you ask for when you say, can you get me Huey Lewis in the news without me being sued? Right. <laughs> but can you get me Huey Lewis in the news, but for $12? Right. Yes. <laughs> Huey Lewis and a newspaper the day after. Is very much what's going on here. It's a name your price, Huey Lewis. Yeah, Huey Lewis and a, and a magazine in your barber shop. The other element that we learn here, and it carries throughout this film, is that for some reason every actor is counting to three before saying their lines. Like someone goes, What did he say? Pause. Would you let the man talk? He had time. Everyone's had time to talk. We could just talk yep. now. When someone ends their line, that is your cue, but not so much here. Everyone's like, we listen, this only stretches to 86 minutes. We could pick up the pace, but it would be a 70 minute movie. <laughs> yeah, it feels so much like it was a director's note that he was like, I don't know, it's just it's just it's just playing too rushed for me. <laughs> or maybe he like thought in post that more cutting would happen. And then he didn't have the coverage to do it. And you're stuck with this five shot of everyone. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the camera locked into the ground. Um, so uh, at the, they all decide now if, if dad wants Ed Jr. to go up and, and shutter this beachside condo for the winter. Sure. Ed's re reticent, but everyone's like, yeah, you should do it. And we'll come. He's like, oh, come on. It's like the least you can do considering you murdered his wife. And he's like, all right. I got a bad feeling about that. No shit. You're in a movie called Fall Break. I mean, yeah. the mutilator. That bad feeling is that Ralph has found somebody who considers his penis. That someone is Sue, and she is poured into the most rigid designer jeans that 1981 could possibly imagine. She is delightful and must have a very poor opinion of herself because she is voluntarily associated with Ralph. <laughs> I mean, maybe she likes redheads. I don't know. Yeah, we we all, you know, 
we maybe she like yeah like i again i have fallen under the spell that is close-up magic <laughs> so <laughs> sure uh, you know everyone's got their something it, yeah. it's magical quite literally um, so we get a whole long, I mean, this is, a, again, to compare this to Shark Night, Gina, uh, we have an entire journey of their taking a trip from college to the shore. It just, you get to see almost every part of it. Ralph peeing, them violating laws, probably should be pulled over for drunk driving, but no one cares. They're white. Oh yeah, I love it. They have like they have a convertible, and and uh, and Ralph's like, ah, just give me a beer. Yeah, <laughs> I mean they they are very proud of putting that cooler on, like in the most prominent space. Like, no, why not put that in the trunk? But no, uh, uh-uh. uh, it's got to be out there. It's um, got to be at reach when you're going sixty miles an hour. Yes, jam into fall break. Uh, just in case you were wondering what kind of character Ralph is, he tries to convince a black store owner that not giving him a senior discount on a single six pack of beer is discrimination. So <laughs> that's that's when I fell out of love with Ralph a little oh, bit. Oh yeah. Uh, that being said, that couple, uh, I love them. I wish they were in every scene of this movie. They're so cute. <laughs> Especially her. She looks right down the pipe of that camera and no one thought, let's do a take two. Don't look exactly in the camera's lens, but they're like, fuck it. We got to move on. I truly wonder if there were any other takes and those were worse because like (laughs) that couple, they weren't even actors. They basically were like, can we shoot in your store? We'll put you in the movie. And the couple was like, hell yes. That's the exact same amount as money for us. So like, I wonder if there are other scenes where it's just her delivering it to camera. That that are worse than that? Oh, oh. There's just worse scenes where like she comes in and she's just shouting for some reason. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> that just doesn't seem the mutilator to me, but who knows? Like anything could happen. Uh, so when they arrive at the condo, it appears that someone has consumed all the alcohol on the eastern seaboard. Like, there are more bottles left inside this condo than at a recycling plant. It's, I guess Big Ed doesn't really care for a type of alcohol, just so long as it's alcohol by the looks of it. Yeah, as long as his brain is pickled, it doesn't matter. (laughs) And uh, Pam is instantly suspicious. uh, And we'll learn that her suspicions will go unheralded. Uh, No one will fucking listen to her. I don't know what it is. I don't know if it's the puffy. Well, no, you know what it is. Mm -hmm. She's a virgin. Oh, that's right. All right. See that virgins are untrustworthy. Somehow they all know this. (laughs) So, you know, somebody in that group's a rat. They all know that one of the six of them murdered their mom with a gun. (laughs) So, like, there's no secrets amongst this group. Yeah, like, they saw all of the alcohol bottles, and they were like, looks like his dad's thirsty. (laughs) And if I walked into anyone's home and I saw that many bottles around the ground, I'd be like, hey, we need to go to a hospital and like, whether it be for like the physical or the emotional, but like, regardless, either one, they are like hospital yeah. right now. You know, something similar is, you know, they find out that the big Ed has a battle ax and it is missing. Yeah. And nobody, nobody but Pam seems to think this is anything to be concerned about. Yeah. We don't really want a loose battle ax in the neighborhood. You know what I mean? I, I think, I think, I think you know, little Ed says, oh, he probably took it with him. <laughs> yeah, probably. <laughs> 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 Amongst the collection here, we have just a, a ton of stuffed animals. Uh, we also have a framed pyramid sinker that has been lodged in the wall, a stolen Mexican artifact, which always puts me at ease. And of course, this missing battle axe. We also have Chekhov's uh, fish gaff. And you really don't want to know where that's headed. Uh, People who haven't watched the movie, I'm going to tell you later. (laughs) Turns out that uh, Senior Big Ed is sleeping with his axe downstairs. He's like snuggling that thing like a teddy bear. (laughs) I I, I love it. He he, he like, I I expected like kind of like, you know, murmur and rub his face against it. (laughs) Only you understand me, bad lax. I love you, Axie. <laughs> He's not taking him from me either. You can shoot this. It's fine. <laughs> <laughs> Bad Lax knows me. He knows my thoughts. <laughs> <laughs> 
Yeah, that we, he could say that, but but also Big Ed has no dialogue in this. No. In this entire movie. He's a mystery. <laughs> just... hey, I'm, I'm sorry, no. When, when he when they finally manage to to defeat him in the end, he does let out a little yell. <laughs> but 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 he does never speaks. No, he doesn't uh speak words so much. He's just an alcohol bag surrounded by dryer lint <laughs> holding a battle axe. Uh, he's a very sweaty sleeper. Uh so cut to butts. This movie believes in butts and wants you to know they exist. Uh, and then uh, we also cut to several um, fantasies of Big Ed. And before you go, ooh, slow this down. Are we talking like <laughs> a Cinemax sort of thing? Like, how exotic does this get? It's all fantasies of Big Ed killing his child. Up until now, he hasn't decided how he might do it. And he's still running through scenarios. But also apparently, like, does does not in his, you know, Fever brain does not realize that Ed is now an adult. No. <laughs> yeah. Right. Ed is still that baby he wishes he can murder. And like the scene plays out, like the way Big Ed approaches it, it feels like they wanted to get the rights to Cats in the Cradle, but they couldn't. <laughs> <laughs> that would have been incredible. The axe in the cradle and the silver moon. I, I, I already like this movie, but that would have made it a masterpiece territory for me. <laughs> If someone could put a fan edit of that together, of those fantasies of Big Ed killing his child <laughs> to Jim Croce. Am I right about that? That's Jim Croce? No, Cat Stevens. Uh, Cat no, Stevens. Uh, uh, Harry Chapin. Harry Chapin. Oh, my God. Well, I thought it was Cat Stevens. Well, who knows? <laughs> who can say? It's a mystery. One of those names is correct. <laughs> I, I, will, I will leave it at that. I'm sure no one will correct us because no one ever does that on the internet. So, uh... We learned that he's taken pictures of a guy he ran over in a boat. <laughs> and this is not like back when everyone had a phone. He's like, hold on, let me get a photograph of this. Now stay still. You're going to put a tripod down? This is a uh, precious memory. <laughs> it's like, oh, no, 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 don't move. That's just the red eye flash before. I just wait. <laughs> just hold on. Wait a second. I want to get my face in. So I'm going to put it on timer. No, 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 no. You stay on the deck. I know you're bleeding. Stop complaining. You're going to want this picture afterwards. Well, let's, let's memorialize this. And then uh, as Linda and Mike give us a tour of Big Ed's murder basement, I'm reminded of the great student bodies gag. Come on, you know that filthy hooks on the wall make me horny. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I love that. Like, you know, Ed is just sort of putting this stuff out. Like, this is normal things for for a person to have around their house. Yeah, and everybody's like, "Wow, that's crazy!" And just like, you know, kind of laughing it off. And and you know, you know, Pam is the only one, you know, who who's you know, remotely put out by any of this. Yeah. yeah, you know, everybody else just like, "Well, that's wacky, Big Ed." <laughs> He's just like completely uh, 98% alcohol and he left with his own battle axe. I mean, it all sounds rational to me. You know, it's not like he 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 might have brought everyone here under false pretenses. What kind of crazy person would do that? <laughs> what kind of crazy person with the battle axe was lure us here alone where no one else is? And everyone has told us. No one is around for miles and miles. Amazing. So uh, as the evening, as the sun dips, Linda and Mike quickly sort of gauge the situation. And no, if they're going to fuck, they're going to have to do it away from these squares. So they start, and I put this in quotes, frolic in the sand. And later they discover a tented pool. Yeah, I don't know what the, this is supposed to be the off season. So why is this pool looking like it's, it's ready to host a party? I I do not know. Uh, it was uh, under construction and that's the only reason why they can use it. But because it was under construction, there was a tarp over it <laughs> to get just in on it. And they're like, you know what? We'll leave it. in. <laughs> yeah. My, my favorite part about that scene is why does the water look like that? Oh, it's probably all the chlorine. Is it safe? Sure. Yeah. I, I have his exact quote to that. And she goes, will it hurt you? And he says, nah, in fact, it'll probably prevent herpes. <laughs> I don't, he, he says the word herpes, like it's a made up word. <laughs> like it's the yeah. First time. And also, I don't want to hear that word when we're like <laughs> about to bang in a pool. Don't say herpes to me. <laughs> Don't drop like, herpes like your salt bay, just sprinkling on a normal conversation. That's not how herpes works. That's not how anything works. Also, it's 
I can only imagine what that smells like too, because I guess they like poured milk in the pool yeah. so that they can like hide bodies under it. But then it's like enough milk to make a pool cloudy. Yeah. And that's on a warm North Carolina night. That plus chlorine smell. My God uh-uh. in heaven. Everyone had a yeast infection. I'm calling it. <laughs> <laughs> they had to have. They had to have. Even people who didn't get in the pool. Once you're in the tent, yeast infection. Yeah. Um, but yeah, when it comes to the herpes things, folks, sex education, get some, won't you? If you ever wanted to watch two pairs of feet take off their clothes slowly, the mutilator is for you. It's not that I need nudity. It's that I, I understand that humans can take off their clothes and I might not dis- need to see every item hit the ground one at a time to believe you're taking off your clothes. I, I, I get it. I've taken off clothes before. Yeah. There's a, you know, it's interesting that as, as gory as this movie gets, Mm -hmm. it's, you know, except for like, you get like one or two boob shots. It's pretty surprisingly modest in that regard. Yeah. Yeah. It's, 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 I think that's why I like the mutilator so much because it's like North Carolina, like conservatively sweet. Mm -hmm. And then suddenly so gory. <laughs> then Mark Shorstman shows up and goes, I want to get jobs off of this. <laughs> and he shows up <laughs> with the goriest shit you've ever seen in your life. It just, it starts off so benign. And it is genuinely sweet, I think, for the vast majority yeah. of the running time. So It's it, pretty saccharine. I think that's what, you know, part of what it appealed to me upon seeing it again was just appreciating this very uh, bloody and sweet combo that it presents because when it gets bloody, holy shit, does it get bloody? Yeah. So these two decide to do what any of us would, and that's play a silent game of Marco Polo where you just constantly look for one another, but only after the other, other person has gone under the water. And Big Ed, unbeknownst to all of us, because we don't see his clothes fall at his feet, He's gotten into the pool naked as well. <laughs> oh, God, you're right. He has. I didn't, I didn't even think about that. But you're right. Because they do show his bare legs like coming out of the uh, yeah. out of the pool. Like, it never yeah. shows him in a swimsuit. Like, like he's not. Oh, man. Wouldn't it, be, wouldn't it be great if, like, he took a clothes and he had like, one of those old-timey, like, striped bathing suits on? <laughs> he's dressed like Goofy at a day at the yes. beach. <laughs> and he just silently drowns Linda. He manages to to drown her and carry her out of the pool all while uh what's the boyfriend's name? Mike. Yeah. Mike is you know somehow underwater and hears none of this. No, Nothing. all the all the blood has rushed to Mike's penis. So he can't hear he, so good. He doesn't hear her thrashing around. No. He, he doesn't hear Big Egg climbing out of the pool carrying a, an entire adult human body <laughs> right. on his back. I'm kind of convinced Mike can't recognize himself in a mirror. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, (laughs) he may possess a baby's object permanence. Yeah, he may not actually be a college student. He may just be kind of hanging around. You know, he can hold his breath for so long. (laughs) The way like people say an ox keeps going long after it dies. (laughs) Where it's just like, he doesn't know that he's dying. So he could just keep going. I mean, that's that's just Mike being Mike. To be, yeah. to be honest with you. If you if you want a sort of flavor of, of how Mike operates, uh, just a few minutes from the, uh, this moment, Mike is surprised by a wooden cutout of a fish. <laughs> not, not a wooden cutout that's moving, just one that exists in the world. So Big Ed is luring Mike with uh, dropped clothing items like uh, breadcrumbs or as Mike might call them, toast peanuts. <laughs> uh, and then uh, he finally lures... Uh, Mike into the the garage of doom and Mike <laughs> hold up Linda's bra like it's a science experiment like man what I could do is one of these and I, at that point I kind of wonder if Mike's okay he's fascinated by it. like like he's never actually seen a bra before <laughs> you saw her take it off Mike <laughs> what is happening you were there Mike oh god that would explain how long he can hold his breath <laughs> True, he might be a real Aquaman, this one. Because he's in that pool for a long time. <laughs> really, yes. He's down there for a good Yeah, you get, you get the holding his breath. You've got the, the chlorine fumes. 
You've got the yeast slowly making its way up to his penis hole. I mean, he's going to have a whole host of problems, but they're only <laughs> going to get worse. Because uh, Big Ed surprises Mike, um, just like the wood cutout. Which isn't hard. No, it is really isn't. Uh, but this time he surprises him with an outboard motor. And we get one of the longest, most unconvincing death scenes that we've <laughs> ever seen on the show. He sort of it sort of reminded me. Do you, you, you remember that clip that uh, went around a couple of years ago? It was like a Turkish movie. Yeah. The woman just keeps like shooting the guy. He's like, ah, <laughs> oh yeah, <laughs> and she shoots him like eight times. There's also that one gif of that guy. He, he sort of has Epstein's hair from Welcome Back, Cotter. <laughs> yes, from Italian Spider Man. <laughs> yeah, it's like that. And he, Big Ed pushes this, you know, motor into this guy's chest, and he just kind of. There's nothing behind Mike, but he somehow he can't back up. He's just like sucked into the vortex of this motor. I don't know, but he gets shredded up. And I mean, shredded up good. He even takes off a couple of fingers. Once again, this is a Mark Sharstrom joint. Like he's not yep. fucking around. He is trying to get work off of this. And this is his real baby. <laughs> That's right. He's showing this shit off all round town like he's getting evil dead 2 off of this gig that is for certain r.i.p.d laura and mike uh you you shall be missed you were beautiful and you were not not smart but you know what you, you're pretty to look at that that's for certain both of you on the other end of the spectrum we're introduced to beach cop uh beach cop menaces junior pam sue and ralph esquire we learn he's a, a lawyer or studying to be one anyways. And Beach Cop states that they shouldn't be out on the beach because they could be struck by lightning, something he is immune to? I mean, it's like chicken pox. You get struck by lightning, and lightning's <laughs> like, oh, we, we got that guy's punch card. We, cut, we can't come back. I did know a kid growing up who had been struck by lightning twice and could not get a driver's license because of it. Oh, my God, what? Yeah. <laughs> We were lifeguards together at, at a Boy Scout uh, camp, and um, he was a water polo player, and one of his claims to fame was that he had been struck by lightning not once but twice. That's okay. incredible. Yeah. No, solid guy. Don't know what he's doing now. Hopefully enjoying life in Burbank. I, I don't know. That's where he grew up. Light, anyway. lighting, some light, lighting some light bulbs by putting them in his mouth. <laughs> like Fester. Just putting them in his mouth and being able to see in a darkened garage. Later, as Beach Cop is investigating mm, something, he takes uh, a wood fence post to the face for Big Ed. That's pretty fucking gnarly. <laughs> <laughs> and he also has a very extended... Ah! Yeah! <laughs> Everyone gets a, lo a long time to go... Ah! Away from camera in this motion picture. Again, if they cut that away, it's like Buddy Cooper would not get paid unless this movie was longer than 84 minutes. It's like, we gotta yeah, keep it I, I, I'm pretty sure that, you know, if you get a fence post through your face, you're, you're dying within about a second and a half about like <laughs> prolonging it by lamenting to the heavens. Where's that lightning? <laughs> And then Big Ed is like tempting fate. He's running around with a big metal object. He is not struck by lightning. We never hear a thunder strike. We never see lightning. That's not a component in this. But Big Ed does uh, seem to decapitate him with that battle axe. Uh, again, Beach Cop does not move away from the situation. Just <laughs> once people are struck by one blow, they're like, it's been a it's been a good life. It's time yeah. to go. Just pay, just patiently waiting for death to come. <laughs> Everyone's just like a water balloon in this movie. <laughs> <laughs> They're bags of blood, you know, walking around on two legs. And speaking of bags of blood, when Big Ed took out Mike, like he's covered in the stuff. And now this is mere moments later and he's clean as a fucking whistle. Does he have an outdoor shower or something? He just walks into the sea, spins around and comes back. <laughs> yeah, basically. Just like, I mean, I know he's not washing himself off with like whatever bottle of vodka he has around. That goes on the inside. <laughs> yeah. That keeps his insides pure. And just in case you were wondering, like Patrick, this sounds way too exciting, way too cool. Like, 
can we slow this down? And I'm like, oh, you're in luck. Because now you have four adults who are about to play blind man's bluff for what feels like 20 fucking minutes. And this game is basically hide and go seek in the dark while involving beer somehow. There's just one problem with this scenario. And that is even when they turn out all the lights inside the house, there appears to be a fucking bat signal worth of light shining through every window and door crack into this house. Like I've attended darker Rolling Stones concerts than this place. <laughs> yeah, this, this whole scene definitely feels like, well, we're not quite an hour yet. <laughs> Like you would say, like, am I getting a lot of character moments here? Not necessarily. You're getting people faking that they can't see, like they're Mr. Magoo, and that's like suspense. <laughs> like Big Ed like wanders in and out a couple times, but nothing happens. Like we're seeing people play a game in real time, and we're like, but that guy just got a fence post through the face. When is that going to happen again? It's like, get back to the kills, man. They want to show us variety. It's a potpourri. They're saving it up for the last half an hour because I think the last half an hour of this motion picture is an all fucking timer. You're, you're waiting. Like you get primed an hour in, but boy, when that last half an hour mark hits, it, it's when this film goes for the gusto. It's not all people slowly drinking natural lights over and over and over again. Uh, they all go up to their rooms and Sue asks Ralph to find their two missing friends before they have sex. And oh no, sped up film and old timey piano gags. <laughs> oh no. That yeah, happens. that was unexpected. Yeah, and it's like out of nowhere. There's no point earlier in the movie where this becomes meatballs. It just happens here. <laughs> I think the director of Shark Knight watched this movie and said, I can make this worse. And he did. <laughs> What if I just took all of the card tricks and charming karate out? <laughs> and I just have one guy standing at the shore with a single arm holding an Aquaman, you know, <laughs> and he kills a hammerhead shark. And that's as exciting as it gets, everybody. Um, so we're left with Ralph. Ralph is is forced to head on out. Uh, and sort of find these two people that they've looked for previously, but have not found. And Ralph lets uh, uh, Ed Jr. and Pam know that this is what he's going to do. He's going to lock up the house, but before he does, he's going to look for these two people. And in the midst of that, if you ever wanted to hear a Stan Laurel impression, but with a Southern accent, the mutilator is for you. <laughs> I mean, really, it really does have it all, doesn't it? Really, it's packed with everything you could possibly want. How many times have we seen this old timey thing, G? Like, what do we name this now? Because we saw it all the time in Friday the Thirteenth, and we never really came up with a name for it. I'm beginning to think it's Bugs Bunny syndrome. Yeah, well, it's because you know, you know, a lot of these movies are are written by you know an, an audience that is older than the audience they're trying to appeal to. Sure, yeah. So you know, their 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 references aren't always topical. <laughs> but yeah, Ralph just happens to have a Stan Laurel impression ready to go, and so he wanders. <laughs> he has a scene. And it's like five minutes inside the garage of doom. And this is underneath the house. Like everyone should be able to hear Mike dying with a motorboat motor, but they don't. So Ralph is just standing there like doing a stand up routine to an empty room, throwing things at the wall and doing gangs. Well, that's, a, that's another, that's another definite trope in slasher movies is the character just talking to themselves. Yeah. <laughs> For sure. just, just do it just, just doing a bit for 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 you know an audience of one <laughs> yeah because they know they're hilarious and to ralph ralph is the greatest audience he'll ever have because oh, he doesn't flip him <laughs> so finally after this and that bit he finally just opens up this door where <laughs> where big ed has been slamming bodies up against these wooden spikes and wouldn't you know it big ed's there and he has this five pronged frog gig is that what that is yeah i think so it, i would call it a trident but it's got five points see that's what i thought it was but i didn't know that tridents have fork rules <laughs> right. 
uh, whatever it is, like it's a, but it's too small to be a pitchfork. I, I think it's a frog gig, yeah, but I'm just talking out my butt on that one. Anyways, uh, Ralph takes it to the neck and then he gets stuck to the door in the very Friday the 13th homage. Uh, Big Ed's got those Voorhees family forearm strength that we love to see. And then Ralph just hangs there, continuing to breathe uh, like, you know, serious actor activist Ron Silver does in Silent Rage. <laughs> beat for beat, same performance. <laughs> when, now, when are we going to do that one? I Well, that, that's what that brings me to the next thing. Vanessa, I found the movie that is both a martial arts film and, and a horror film. And that is Silent Rage. Oh, I love building these lists. So tell me. You wouldn't need a second movie. You've got one movie that's got it all, baby. So like this list of movies that are kicking and screaming, because like I really perk up anytime somebody brings it up. Right now, I think is like four movies long (laughs) with Silent Rage being added uh, because that's a like brilliant, brilliant choice. Cause I think the four movies that go under the categories of like kicking and screaming are now silent rage. Yeah. Holy shit. Yeah. Why have I never thought of that? My mind is blown. I'm going to tell my co-host slash husband after this and he's going to yell, uh, <laughs> blood moon. Yes. Mm-hmm. Which, uh, please. I hope somebody does on kill by kill at some point. <laughs> we'll put it on the list. It'll be in the, Oh my time. God. Yes. Um, encounters of the spooky kind. Oh, that's a great movie. Sam yeah. Hung, and then very, I think, obvious both. Um, the night comes for us, sure, yeah, 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 yeah. I and then, like, aren't you guys doing Ninja 3? We just did Ninja 3, okay. and that's one that like covers under the category of both, except yeah. um, because it's us, we paired it with The Exorcist, sure. uh, <laughs> a natural thing. Both of them involve sex with tomato juice, that's the natural exactly. connection between those two films. It feels like we put truffles on like a microwave pizza. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. Well, let me tell you, that is very evocative. I enjoy that very Thank much. You. Uh, yeah. When you guys do silent rage. Uh, oh, I can't wait. And we're going to have you on specifically for silent rage. <laughs> it's a date because yeah. we, we've been threatening it here for a while, but you know what? It's, it's time to cross over. This is where our worlds merge. Uh, that movie is <laughs> interesting. So sadly, Ralph goes, and uh, as the door closes on his performance in the movie, this the door sounds like a fart. I don't know if that was intentional. <laughs> it's just something. But I it enjoy. totally does. Speaking of things that I enjoy, Sue is wearing a nightgown. Nightgowns, everybody. Movies need more nightgowns. It's a, yeah, she got that like this like wuthering this like this wuthering heights nightgown that does does not look like anything like a nineteen year old college student would be wearing. No, it looks like she's escaping a Victorian castle in a, in a novel that you'd find in, in paperback. All of my favorite horror movies open with someone in a nightgown. Gown. Great. A fucking mortuary is filled from top to bottom with nightgowns. That's another one on a stay tuned level. Like mortuary. Yes, is... we did mortuary, and it's a nightgown party. It really is. <laughs> it's fantastic. It's not very. It's not very death filled, but it is full of character choices and nightgowns. Oh, that's got a very Mike like character in that. He's a real. Oh sex yeah. Dummy. Yeah. He's a big sex dummy. <laughs> For sure. Quick question about the movie soundtrack. Um, did the composer use all of his talent on the theme song? Is that why he plays a Casio with only his nose for the rest of the movie? The strong decline between <laughs> like this theme song that again feels very much like I want to pay for Buddy Holly, but I don't have him. Yeah. Um, I mean, not Buddy Holly. Um, other music that uh, every dad in my life uh, enjoys. Hugh Lewis. But... Uh, for the entire rest of it, it very much was just like, what if uh, we did John Carpenter on a children's toy? <laughs> but they're not even like full musical compositions. They're, they're always composed of like two opposing notes, like bing, bing, bong, yes. bong, ba, beep. Unless it gets like kind of cartoony. Like there's a scene earlier in which Ralph has promised sex for I'm trying to remember what reason, but it goes through this weird scene where it like speeds up Ralph, like the idea that Ralph's moving at like super speed, but it gets very cartoony. Mm -hmm. It's like, it's straight out of Carrie of the, of of like getting ready for prom. (laughs) 
for that movie. Like it's so measured up until that point. And then at the, he's like, ah, oh, fuck it. We're going to speed this shit. up. <laughs> like, okay. I'm in, in for a penny in for a pound. But uh, while Ralph is being murdered and Sue is concerned, uh, Pam is just constantly being woken up by strange noises. And finally she just shoves junior like, come on, we got to do something. And they go, uh, and then you see them get up out of bed, and they're both fully clothed. Oh, yeah. Like, they they slept in all their full clothes. Like, I know they did have a conversation earlier where they said, hey, we both agreed we're not having sex tonight. But let's both sleep on our clothes that we spent all day in drinking beer and sweating in for sleepy times. <laughs> Pam was making sure they stayed virgins. <laughs> right. So now everyone is up. Uh, Sue is cajoled, unfortunately, into dressing in real clothes. And and they go, let's split up. And and Junior goes, you two, you go around this way. I'll go the, around the other. And Sue's like, no, I'll go solo. <laughs> go. Pam doesn't want to leave. Doesn't doesn't want to leave Ed. Yes. So so Sue's like, fine, I'll just go by myself. <laughs> fine. Yeah. I'll be solo. I think she could sense that Ed, if he was in any danger, would be in danger at this house in which his father that wants to kill him inhabited at some point. Right. I mean, Junior is, uh, we will find, uh, useless. <laughs> the rest of the motion picture. So it doesn't matter who's paired with him. Uh, he's not helping. Uh, but Sue, unfortunately, immediately goes into the garage of doom. And she is nabbed by Big Ed, who kind of loosely holds her by the neck. And that seems to be enough. And then we get the, dare I say, money shot uh, of, of the mutilator, where Big Ed takes a, a, a fish gaff and enters through her vagina and out through her pelvic area uh, slowly. Again, pretty gnarly. It is gnarly to the max. It is so gnarly. It is so not what you expected from earlier in this movie when things like video machine and like, yeah, you know, friendship montages are happening because it feels so like sitcom y for most of the movie. And then you have this effect that like even people on set were like, yeah, some of us had to like take a few steps away. Some people got like nauseous. Someone barfed. Like it's seriously gross. And this is the point when I was watching it and I thought, oh, up until this point, like this is perfect for the show. And I'm like, no, no one will ever want to talk about this movie. It's just so ballsy and horrifying and like it's mm-hmm. also one of those practicals that are like every sense of the word uh in that because like i love any practical that involves household items because it's just like yeah if you're like creative enough and fucking sick and twisted enough you can look at a household item and mm-hmm. be like oh this would be a great uh, you know x thing and like <laughs> most of it is just condoms filled with blood and, and it, it's just all crammed on in there. But, like, it visually, does. it looks fantastic. Like, if you were at any point someone that was, like, a Herschel Gordon Lewis fan, you were getting what you oh, wanted yeah, yeah, for yeah, here. Yeah. Yes. No. <laughs> yeah. I mean, this puts all of his films to bed. Like, And it's it's shot in a way where everything is so dark that what is lit you know, brings it around to the realm of possibility. And of course, like, you know, it's the, the old trick that, you know, she's half an old magician's trick. I'm sorry to bring that up again, Vanessa, but uh, the bottom half of her body is sunk into this tool. Uh, you know, uh, what is that called? Like a workbench, a, a tool bench. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, and so the bottom half is just the dummy and they're operating the legs with like little sticks and, <laughs> oh my God, it's so grisly and kind of awesome and, uh, amazing. And I'm so happy that we get to talk about this. Oh my God. So it, it just, we've reached a, a, a nadir point We're we're down to our final two. And of course, uh, Pam and junior kind of magoo their way into the garage they find sue's body she, she's been finally decapitated after after that misery and junior does what any of us would would do and that is trap his girlfriend inside a closet for her safety sure yeah 
I think I might hate Junior more than more than Ralph. Yeah, he's kind of he, he's kind of incompetent, isn't he? Oh, he's real dumb. He's uh, super not smart, and you know he he has he's the one who enters this film with a real body count. So yeah, he, well, and and also he makes a puzzling choice to be be the only mode of transportation to to a, a remote beach house using a car that doesn't start properly. <laughs> right. I mean, they make a point of saying it doesn't start properly several times where you're just yes. like, mm, got it. Mm. Yeah, obviously this is, you know, meant, meant to be, you know, you know Chekhov's shitty car. <laughs> right. That this is going to be, this is going to prove to be a problem later in the movie. But why would you, why would that be the vacation car? Why would that, <laughs> that be the car know. that every that everybody gets into to go to this far off beach house? I don't, well, I, Ed Jr. hasn't been right since he killed his mom. <laughs> He's not a good planner. We obviously see that he's not good with details very early on in the motion picture. So, uh, yeah, Junior has some issues. Uh, and so this is when he learns that his father has been the one who is murdering everyone. And they It's my dad. <laughs> that he's my dad. Um, they have a one-on-one that really only adds up to one. Because Junior does not last five seconds in this. Yeah. He, get, he gets choke slammed. And then when he says boo, he takes the spike on the top of that battle axe to the thigh. And I'm really okay with it. Yep. He's uh, he's had it coming this entire time. It's cathartic. <laughs> then you at least know he's taken damage. That's He's had some sort of recompense for leading everyone to their own death. Uh, so far in the movie, but Pam, AKA the greatest human alive manages to uh, get out of the, that closet and throw one of those pyramid sinkers into big Ed's temple, which he seems to enjoy. And I don't know if it's just that it's because it's so hard to do. He appreciates a good shot or game recognizes game, but he's got a big smile on his face. Yeah. He's realizing that his daughter-in-law is like, <laughs> Unlike his son, not at all bitch made. Like, <laughs> where it's like, why couldn't it have been you? Like, why couldn't you be my child? <laughs> You're great. Everything, I like everything about you. Get away from this loser. Wait a second. I'll just kill him. And this, you know, evokes another film of the era. One I, I is another coming soon for this, uh, this podcast. Just before dawn. Because in that, we witness another guy shrink from action during the finale <laughs> who just goes mm, this is too i can't do this i'm gonna just, i'm gonna cower everybody i'm gonna be over here cowering and junior's just into it meanwhile pam finds a knife and just sinks it into big ed's chest right above his heart we don't deserve pam <laughs> no none yeah, of us she's deserve a, she, pam she's a stone cold killer like she is fucking bad ass and it's not just because she's a virgin. She has many other attributes. She starts fires. She knows notices missing battle axes. She can stab a guy. She's got everything going for her. Just questionable taste in men. Yeah. <laughs> Which, like, again, who amongst us hasn't dated an Ed Jr. or five magicians? <laughs> true. Very true. We, you can't judge her. And, of course, uh, I think the chef's kiss uh, on this particular sequence is that Big Ed falls right on top of Junior's leg. You'll love to see it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Somehow, and, and I don't I don't remember seeing this, it just kind of jumps to this conclusion where Junior is tied up at the feet and 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 uh, wrists. I don't when did he tie him off? When was that happening? Yeah, I I every time it gets to this point, I'm just like, did I fall asleep for 6 seconds? <laughs> Did this happen when they were playing Blind Man's Bluff and I just didn't notice? I'm not sure. Wouldn't have mattered. Junior is pretty much useless regardless. But uh, then uh, Pam just cuts through that with the battle axe, pushes Big Ed off of Junior, and they hobble to the car. And she puts him in the driver's seat. <laughs> and she's just, she thinks the best of everyone, I think, is what it is. Because he goes, I don't think I can drive. And she's like, oh, of course. Like, yeah, <laughs> yeah, you're going you're gonna to have to drive the car. And then they yell and apologize to each other for about two minutes about the car not starting. 
but it's just kind of table setting because Big Ed is back and he's trying to TJ Hooker his way into this car, which is a convertible with that battle axe. And it just takes one cigarette lighter to the hand for all of his troubles. And he kind of sinks backwards. And then, then he finally makes a noise. Yeah. <laughs> then he finally registers discomfort with something. Um, in the distance, we see the car arrive, uh, the cops arrive. I, I don't know how they were called. They just were patrolling the neighborhood. It's a it's a lucky time for both of them, but their luck continues because the car starts just as we see that Big Ed is trying to yet again pull himself back inside of this jalopy, and Pam just fires up that car and backs it straight into a cinder block cinder block retaining wall, chopping Big Ed. In half. <laughs> and, I, I, and this is where, like, I'm on my feet. It doesn't matter how many times I've seen the movie, but it's going for it. It is swinging for the fences. When they pull away, he Big Ed is not so big anymore. He's kind of two big pieces. Yes. He just kind of splats to the ground. <laughs> Amazing. And, like, I, I love this ending so much because it's also, so the original ending that they had planned got canceled like day of they, the ending that they had planned was they wanted him to be cut in half by a drawbridge (laughs) and the city was like, no. And so they're like, we need to come up with an ending quickly and one that looks great. And I think they have like most of the rigging to be cut in half by a drawbridge. So when that car cuts him in half, I mean, they got two pieces of them. They got to figure it out somehow. And they, I think I honestly, I think it works out for the best. I think so too. You don't want to prolong this. You can't have him hanging off the back of the car, like a Terminator. That's not not what this movie's (laughs) built for. And, and yet, speaking of prolonging, yeah. when the when the when the when the cop goes up to to check his body, you, it, Big Ed does one more surprise and cuts the cop's leg. Off just a guy he's legs. never met before. He's just like, take, like, uh, listen, I'm not going to leave this mortal coil until I take one more leg off at the knee. <laughs> and I, I like the mutilator, like. I don't know why it persists to have Junior, like, come and visit Pam in the hospital. I don't know why she's there. She's just recovering mentally, I suppose, from all the trauma. But I don't need that. You can end right with Big Ed screaming to heaven like he's going to Montero I think, I his think, way down to hell on a pole. Just I, think, I, think they I think they should have just, like, freeze-framed it on me, like, ah! <laughs> <laughs> he just, like, Big Ed has energy <laughs> like he just he chops the guy's leg off at the knee why just because he has like a joie de vivre one last one that's why <laughs> one more for the road <laughs> i got an axe uh, what am i like i'm not gonna walk this one off my legs are over there and he's wham oh fucking mountain the mutilator i goddamn love it it's the best yeah, you can't not you can't not love it. Even the even the tonal shifts, which is something I normally don't like, mm-hmm. they just were so amusing to me that, <laughs> that that I was totally on board with it. Yeah, it's it's a movie that like every it's so charming despite itself. Mm-hmm. And I think a lot of it is it has like summer camp energy to it where you know everyone's staying on set together everyone has that like really good chemistry it's why you have that blooper reel it feels like you know the way like at the end of a jackie chan movie you always have a blooper reel because he has the same team always it's the same people that like work together so like their energy on set comes through Mm -hmm. i get a little bit of that through the mutilator like i get that same like oh we're like this is our movie every person had like of a, as much input as they wanted to have in on it to where like, even though it came out with like all of the issues that it did, it's really charming. No, it's got a very, you know, we've got a barn. Let's put on a show. Yeah. Sort of feeling to it. Uh, any other details that we missed along the way that we want to cover? <laughs> I do want to say, mm-hmm. um, for anybody that's going to watch the mutilator tonight, which I hope you do. Um, the woman that just plays the mother who is credited as mother is the director's wife who had to do it because the other actress dropped out. And 
when asked in an interview what her only like regret or choice she would have made differently uh because all she does she she's never acted before she mm. catered on set all she really was thinking was if i blink my husband's going to be mad at me uh <laughs> They asked her, like, if she would change anything, what would she have changed about her performance? And she says she regrets never eating the cake. <laughs> sure. It looks delicious. It looks great. I'm so sad that she never got to eat that birthday cake. Because <laughs> she was shot in the spine by her own son. You know. Exactly. Uh, thank goodness there's such wonderful fantasy after that because that there's there's a little too much realism to that sort of thing like there's not a lot of realism but there's kind of yeah it yeah it's got real locked in a refrigerator in a junkyard energy to it mm -hmm. um so before we wrap things up of course there is a game we all like to play it's called choose your own death venture and that's where we decide of the deaths presented in this film, if you had to die that way, which one would you choose and why? Up for bid today, we have shot in the back by your child, drown in an overchlorinated pool, motorboat motored to death, fence post to the face, plus decapitated, frog gig to the throat, fish gaff to the vagina, plus decapitated, stabbed, pyramid sinker to the temple, cut in half, by an automobile plus wall. So, Vanessa, as our guest, I choose you to go first. You know, I've actually been thinking about this this whole episode because uh, there's a lot of really fantastic deaths and, like, you know, a lot of the flashy ones are tempting because then mm -hmm. I can, like, guarantee after death that no one would stop talking about me. <laughs> <laughs> like, my name would be carried on in, like, true crime podcasts and, you know tacky tourist photos it's for the rest of my life casket, but you'll get people talking that's for sure it'll yeah. be a conversation but mm -hmm. i think i want to go for like the amalgamation of the most positives and i think it's going to be shot in the back by my own child <laughs> sure um because uh my last memory will be frosting mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> sure you're going out on a high i'm going out on that. a high um yeah. It was truly an accident. If anything, they were trying to do something nice for their father. And if I didn't like my husband, then that would be like kind of great. Where it's like, ha ha, fuck your birthday. <laughs> um, thankfully, I do. So not him. But like if it was Big Ed, then like, yeah, yeah Big Ed gets that. Uh, and uh, yeah, I, I also guarantee that uh, whatever it is that we had a fight about that week, I got to be right forever. <laughs> There you go. Going out on two highs. Uh, yep. Gina, what say you? Gosh, um, I'm sort of torn between the uh, the, the you know, mini pitchfork or frog gig or whatever the hell it is to the throat. Mm -hmm. Or I don't know, that, that fence post to the face is pretty spectacular. <laughs> it really is. I, I'm not a big fan of, of you know facial injuries as no. much as I like as much as I like Guillermo del Toro movies. Right. But uh you know, I am going to go ahead and take take a uh, fence post to the face. Nice. At least, at least he eventually puts me out of my misery by chopping my head off. Yeah, it doesn't last long. You're going to get that head chopped off real fast. Plus, you get to walk around a beach with a radio. You love that. Yeah. That ain't, that ain't bad. That ain't bad. <laughs> it's very, very true. I, I, I like the fast ways out. Yes. Uh, we're big fans of the fast ways out here. That, that is our primary thing. I think, though, of all of these deaths... I think I got to go with stabbed pyramid sinker to the temple cut in half by an automobile only because I get to hold a battle axe while I'm doing it. And that's going to really bolster my rep in the neighborhood after the fact. They're like, well, yes, he went crazy, but did you hear he cut off a cop's leg? Like as he died? Like, yeah, I was gonna say, that's, that's, that's the main reason that, that you want it. So you can do that little, like, you know, you pop up like a snake out of a can of peanuts and cut somebody's <laughs> leg off. Yeah, that's the appeal. I, that, that is the one thing we have not covered on this podcast is a killer who yells peanut brittle as he kills people. Like when it, ho Hollywood, make that happen. Uh, <laughs> I know you're listening, Mr. Hollywood. Uh, if you got that one for free. Uh, so before we go, of course, we want to plug things. Uh, Vanessa, where can people find you and hear more about what you're doing? 
Um, you can find me on at Ness Gritton on all forms of social media. I haven't changed my last name on all of that yet, but it's N-E-S-G-R-I-T-T-O-N. Um, I uh, occasionally write for Fangoria, both uh, in the printed and online publications, if you want to check out some of my horror stuff there. Um, I have a podcast called Kicking and Screaming, which we mentioned is where we make double features out of horror movies and martial arts movies. Um, and every Thursday, you can find me on Twitch on Fandom Tabletop. Mm. Um, I've gotten into tabletop gaming big time within the last few years, but more so, uh, in quarantine, especially because it feels like you can make something out of thin air when you like feel particularly creatively stifled. True. Um, and they have let me not only run a game for the first time. So I'm like writing the story and, you know, creating all of the monsters and stuff that they're going to fight. But they're letting me do a horror one. So Ooh. I'm very excited. Um, I've been just watching all of my favorite things and thinking uh, what elements I want to like put in. Because when else do you get to just like write a story out of your ass as you go along as like all of your friends play in a world you made? So I'm hoping that it can like serve as like an example to where if you're at home and you're quarantined and you haven't seen your friends for a while, you can maybe start a game together and like make a fun new horror story. Yeah, love it. That sounds fantastic. Gina, where can people find you on these here internets? I write about TV and movies at thespool.net. Um, this coming month of May, I will be covering the um, the uh, hotly awaited Netflix movie, The Woman in the Window, with uh, <laughs> with Amy Adams. Sure. Uh, I mean, I, I, I you know, I, it's, it's supposedly it's hotly awaited. I don't know. We'll mm-hmm. see. Um, and I will also be writing an anniversary piece on a true horror movie. Oh. Todd, Todd Solons' Welcome to the Dollhouse. Ooh. <laughs> wow. Okay. That's heavy. Yes. It's I'm excited. excited. A fun one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and and I'm also I am also uh, on Twitter under porcelain seven two. Do it today. People, check it out. You can find us on all the socials. Please rate and review us on iTunes. It's uh, how we're seen and heard by more people. Uh, thankfully, we're back up on iTunes after a couple of days of them denying our existence. Uh, that's very nice. We've regained our standing on all the charts, and that's very neat. Uh, thank you to all of you who helped make that happen. Of course, we are available on Patreon. And uh, just this last month, we have a new episode where we're covering Annihilation, our pseudo animal attacks April uh, episode for the month. And it's fantastic. Check it out. Of course, next week, it's the return of everyone's favorite culinary giant. That's right. We're back for season two of Dish by Dish and Hannibal. We're going to check in with those two scamps who just can't seem to say I love you enough. They just got to kill people or solve murders. And so we're going to talk about Hannibal starting next week. Every other week, we'll be covering it episode by episode. You can find Hannibal on Netflix right now. And so that's it. We're back after that with another movie. We don't know what it is going to be fun. But until then, for myself, for Gina and Vanessa, the body count will continue. Goodbye, everybody. Bye. Bye.